Greetings. I welcome you or welcome you back to the fourth and final lectures of the Pandemics in History series with Professor Michael Rossi. Today we are learning about a pandemic that many of us remember and lived through, AIDS. It is still there. It is still in our world, very active. If you came a bit early to the lecture, you would have heard some music. It was AIDS Ward Scherzo, written in 1992 by an American com musician and composer, Robert Savage. Savage died in New York City of complication due to AIDS in 1993. My name is Emily Lynn Osborne, and I'm the interim dean of the Graham School of Continuing Professional and Liberal Studies. I am also an associate professor here at the University of Chicago. For those of you who have been following our series, you were aware that last week we called attention to the protests and uprising focused on racial injustice in this country. Today, we would like to talk briefly about a movement called Shut Down STEM, which calls upon researchers, students, leaders, and others in STEM fields to stop work and to actively contribute to efforts to combat racism and inequity in their profession. Organizers of this movement include astrophysic astrophysicist Dr. Brian Nord of Fermilab and the University of Chicago. As he and others have pointed out, seeming, seemingly objective scientific fields of inquiry and research are steeped in biases and processes that marginalize people of color. This process is starkly seen in the underrepresentation of African Americans and Blacks in STEM fields, but it also manifests itself in more subtle and also pernicious ways in the ways that research topics are framed and studies, who and what is studied. I encourage you to learn more about this movement and do your part to support it. What we have learned over the course of this series is that pandemics are not simply biological, but they are also social and cultural. Likewise, science, for all its claims to being objective and apolitical, is not detached from politics, from power, from, and from the biases and, and assumptions that perniciously infect human interactions and that can set apart, demean, and denigrate. The AIDS pandemic offers a case study in those processes. In the United States, the first wave of AIDS patients who captured the attention of the medical community were white gay men. And the fact that these men were not heteronormative white men generated grave and enduring consequences. Consequences for how AIDS and AIDS patients were treated by the medical and scientific communities in that first generation and indeed well beyond. Tonight, our speaker is Michael Rossi. We will get to him soon. But first, a couple of announcements. First, Zoe Eisenman will tell you about the workings of this webinar. Second, we will turn to Gus Moss, who is going to talk briefly about the Masters of Liberal Arts for those of you who want to find a bit more about all that can be done and studied here at the Graham School remotely. And now it's offered remotely. Finally, I want to make note and invite you to take part in an exciting development in our series. We have decided to add one more session next Wednesday, which will be a small seminar discussion with readings with Professor Rossi. The session is capped at 20 students. We will randomly draw names from those names, those people who enter their names. To enter for a chance at one of these spots, you need to enter your name in the web page, which we will post, which we will, you need to enter your name to the web page, and we will post that web page to the question and answer box. So I hope you will put your name in. I hope you will try to join us next week at the session. So now I will turn it over to Zoe. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you all for joining our presentation today. I did want to let you know that we are recording this presentation so that we can post it online later to watch at another later time. Um, this is a webinar presentation, so you will be unable to mute, unmute your microphones and your video will not appear on the screen. You will not be able to use the chat function, but we do encourage you to participate by con considering the questions that Professor Rossi poses during the lecture. You can put your responses in the question and answer box at any time during the lecture. You'll find the button to open the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom window. 
You can also use the Q&A to ask questions for the Q&A period at the end of the lecture um, and at various points during the lecture, which uh, either I or Emily will relate to our speaker. Due to the number of participants, we are unable to have indiv individuals answer their own questions, ask their own questions, excuse me. Um, and I did put the link to the seminar discussion in the chat box uh, for all attendees. Um, so if you were looking for that, it should be in there as well. Um, now I would like to turn this over to Gus Moss to say a few words about the MLA program. Thank you very much, Zoe, and greetings to all. The Master of Liberal Arts or MLA program at the University of Chicago attracts intellectually curious adults who like to ask questions and share ideas. Your MLA classmates are likely to be as diverse as Chicago is. People who spend their days managing project teams or developing software, caring for patients or young children, responding to public safety emergencies or customers needing assistance. This variety contributes to an engaging and enlightening exchange of views. Through reading, reflection, lecture, and lively discussions, MLA students study the works of great thinkers and gain the tools to apply interdisciplinary thought to their professional lives. In small classes, all taught by University of Chicago faculty, students engage and wrestle with great ideas as they work towards developing their own ways of thinking and solving problems. The MLA curriculum builds on an interdisciplinary foundation. The degree requirements include four core classes drawing from the humanities, social sciences, biological sciences, and the physical sciences. Students then build on four elective courses of their choosing before enrolling in their thesis course. The MLA is a degree program designed with the busy schedule of a working professional in mind. The program offers a flexible course schedule now available via a remote option, making our MLA program ideal for adults with busy professional lives. For professional advancement or personal enrichment, our MLA program helps you sharpen your analytic skills, think and plan at a strategic level, better express your ideas and make more convincing arguments. Students refine valuable skills like critical thinking, writing, developing and presenting solutions, and constructively challenging conventions and assumptions. The program is a rare combination of academic rigor and flexibility that reflects what University of Chicago President Robert Zimmer has said is this university's defining feature, a firm belief in the value of open, rigorous, and intense inquiry. We hope that you'll visit our website at mla.uchicago.edu and reach out to us to learn more about the program. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll now return the floor to Dean Osborne. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Gus. And now I will formally introduce Professor Michael Rossi, who we are all here to hear and learn from. Our speaker, Michael Rossi, is an assistant professor of science and medicine in the Department of History here at the University of Chicago. As I have noted before and will note again, he is actually an associate professor effective on July 1st. He earned tenure this past academic year. Michael teaches classes such as history of perception and lab field and clinic. These courses consider the relationship of physiology, graphic representation, and linguistics. His book, The Republic of Color, Science, Perception, and the Making of Modern America, published by the University of Chicago Press, is an intellectual history of color theory. Professor Rossi's most recent publication, Visualizing Viruses, came out in the April 23rd issue of the London Review of Books. A small piece of trivia about Michael, before becoming going off to graduate school and getting his doctorate, he worked as a graphic designer in New York City. Michael, to you. At first, I just wanted to welcome everyone again. All right. Uh, thank you, Emily, uh, and thank you, Zoe, for taking us through the through the rules. Um, and thanks to all of those who provided support in making this video. And of course, once again, uh, thank you all, uh, all of you who are watching as well. Uh, I just before we started, I wanted to very briefly echo what Emily said uh, and to acknowledge support and gratitude once again uh, for those who are standing against police violence and against systematic racism. Um, 
Uh, as Emily said, today I want to follow the sentiments of those who are calling on us to consider, consider the subtle, uh, pervasive, and in some respects invisible ways that racism, marginalization, silencing, and exclusion uh, inflect even the pursuit of ostensibly apolitical acts and practices like, like the sciences and like medicine. It's been one of our goals through these uh, sessions to look at uh, and to really stick with the ways that political and ideological forces shape the practice of medicine. And we've been hoping to outline how these forces operate particularly in times uh, such, of, uh, such as our own of pandemic disease. Uh, and so again, when considering how to answer the call for a STEM and academic work stoppage, we decided after some discussion to follow the organizers call for, uh, calls to, and I quote here, quote, engage in deeper awareness and dialogue. That is to say, uh, to engage in conversation rather than uh, observe silence. We hope therefore to use our limited time uh, here to open a lasting discussion about issues of discrimination and stigma in medicine, uh, to look at the ways that uh, police authority is to say state authority, the authority of the state, uh, is differentially directed at marginalized populations uh, even under the guise of progress and healing. And so with that, let's proceed. Uh, before we begin, I would like for the final time simply to offer a word of caution. Uh, for this session, uh, we will sometimes be dealing with vivid uh, and possibly upsetting images and descriptions. They are once again necessary historical artifacts, but you may find them unsuitable uh, depending on your disposition or the disposition of those who are watching with you. Uh, so secondly, I just want to reiterate uh, what uh, Emily said just now. Uh, we will take, uh, Emily and Zoe said just now, we will take questions uh, throughout, the, throughout the session using the uh, Q&A function, I guess on Zoom, uh, and we will discuss the readings uh, after, uh, following from these questions, which I, I think uh, the introduction to the readings was, uh, uh, was not posted. So um, it might have been, uh, you, we wouldn't have gotten these questions in advance. Um, but something to think about now is, uh, simply uh, these questions of how the text articulates the rights and duties of patients and how those rights and duties compare to other plagues we've seen, uh, other uh, pandemics we've seen, plague, cholera, and pandemic influenza, and also the question of the relationship between disease, morality, and medicine that's articulated by particularly the text that you read, um, and one could reflect on others that we've read throughout. Uh, finally, I'll say that there is, uh, once again, an image. Uh, there should be a list of the images used and their attributions at the end of the talk. Uh, we will post the list, uh, this and other lists uh, for previous talks uh, at a point on the website, um, I suppose to be determined. Um, and also uh, several of you have requested bibliographies and so we'll uh, work on providing those as well for further reading. Um, so with that, let us turn to AIDS, politics and power. And let's begin with a prediction from the past about the future of medicine. Uh, this will come from uh, Frank McFarlane Burnett, uh, who is a well-known physician, virologist, and Nobel Prize laureate, uh, who in 1962 wrote, and I quote, one can think of the middle of the 20th century as one of the most important social revolutions in history, the virtual elimination of infectious disease as a significant factor in social life. And of course, we might raise an eyebrow today as we recall our past three months of quarantine, and certainly people in resource-poor communities would have a differing opinion and would have had at the time. But consider the moment uh, in which Burnett made this statement, uh, the mid 20th century, uh, mid to late 20th century, a uh, period of profound pride about the accomplishments of biomedicine, at least among practitioners. So uh, the identification of pandemic influenza as a virus in the 1930s, uh, and indeed the development of the fields of virology and microbiology which is one sign of the power of modern medicine. And here, this is a, an electron uh, micrograph of uh, influenza A. This is from 1975, not from 1930, uh, courtesy of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, antibiotics, as we mentioned last week, had by 1962, rendered a vast array of bacterial infections harmless to human lives and health. Moreover, by the middle of the century, an increasingly powerful pharmaceutical industry coupled with equally energized uh, marketing and advertising industries, was responsible for bringing a dizzying array of new therapeutics to consumer markets, uh, not just medicines for bodily illness, but medicines for uh, psychological and psychiatric illness as well. And here, I just wanted to show you an advertisement for an antidepressant. Uh, this would have been aimed at physicians, so uh, aimed at, uh, aimed at uh, physicians who are reading a uh, medical journal. Uh, and it depicts a woman, uh, clearly distressed behind a cage of housework implements. Uh, and it tells physicians here, you can't set her free 
but you can help her feel less anxious. And so I bring this up simply to note the ways in which this coalition of uh, pharmacology, medicine, and advertising uh, served to reinforce social roles, even as it notionally worked towards progress. Uh, so we have here an idea of change, but without revolution. Uh, we also see, uh, by the middle of the century, national and international medical bodies, the World Health Organization, whose logo is shown here, uh, the American Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health, the French Pasteur Institute, and the German Robert Koch Institute. Uh, these and other institutions had worked hard to ameliorate disease, uh, not only within national borders, but around the globe. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, biomedicine increasingly, by mid-century, intervened on the most intimate levels of individuals' daily lives. So the birth control pill, uh, this is a model of a birth control pill from a museum in, uh, exhibit in 1970. I don't know of any birth control pill that was actually stamped with the label of the pill. Um, but the birth control pill was just one way in which medicine both shaped and constrained individuals' identities and desires. One thinks also of the Kinsey report on sexuality, for instance, and the identification of homosexuality as a mental illness at the middle of the century. All of these are ways in which medicine intervened uh, from birth to death and at all points in between in everyday life uh, by the mid to late 20th century. And so when Burnett made his statement, he could claim good evidence for his prediction. General indices of health were in ascension. Infectious disease was on the decline, as shown here in a, um, in a pamphlet by an insurance agency around mid-century. All of this was thanks, according to many observers, to medicine. And yet, we know now that McFarland Burnett's prognosis, uh, and I should say he wasn't alone. Uh, many of his peers made similar statements, so this is not just one, one person's idiosyncrasy. Um, we know now that McFarland Burnett's prognosis about the future of infectious disease was wildly, even hubristically, overconfident. Just a little more than a decade after the publication of his statement, a new disease was beginning to emerge into view of public health organizations like the CDC. It began slowly with some isolated cases, but soon became a global health crisis, demanding the attention of politicians and patients, as well as physicians and medical researchers. The disease, of course, was HIV AIDS, uh, shown here in a colored electron micrograph, uh, again, courtesy of the CDC. It has, since 1981, killed an estimated 36 million people worldwide, according to World Health Organization estimates, and another 38 million people, again, uh, WHO estimates, are currently living with the virus. HIV AIDS came into public consciousness in a world, as we said, with unprecedented degrees of medical infrastructure, unprecedented degrees of medical technology, and unprecedented medical surveillance. And these innovations were tightly interwoven with expectations about civil life, individual identity, and even art and culture. Uh, and here, uh, this is an iconic allegory for the HIV AIDS crisis by the artist uh, David Monorovich. It was for this reason, this reason of entwined technologies, expectations, art, and culture, um, that theorist Paula Treichler described AIDS in 1987 as, quote, an epidemic of signification, that is, an epidemic of meaning making. We know, of course, from our discussions of plague, of cholera, of the 1918 influenza pandemic, that all epidemics, all pandemics, are in some ways epidemics of meaning making. But HIV AIDS forms a particularly fitting conclusion for our four part survey of global pandemics and history because the organizational environments of HIV AIDS are very much like our own. And the ways in which people made sense of disease, let's say the ways in which people made meaning from disease in the time of HIV AIDS, have conditioned our own responses in many ways uh, to mass sickness today, including COVID-19. So I would once again, and finally, like to proceed in three parts. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the early years of this epidemic of signification. I'd talk, like to talk about what the new disease meant, how it was understood, and how different understandings of the disease had very different uh, political and social uh, implications. Then we will look at the period from roughly the middle of the 1980s through the uh, early 1990s, a period in which the disease was increasingly feared as an aspect of civic life, but in which official state response tended to be judicial and punitive rather than clinical. Finally, we'll look at the ascendancy of patient activism, in which the demands of patients and patient advocates shaped both the official response to the disease and the expected roles and rights of citizens in the face of a new health crisis. And I should add here that this is going to be uh, principally, although uh, by no means entirely uh, an American story, uh, this just reflects my own field expertise. Uh, it is not a tacit assumption or, or a historical fact, certainly, about the scope of HIV AIDS 
or the true importance of particular actors, nations, institutions, or people. Okay, so um, with that, let's start with this idea of signification, meaning making. So how do people make sense of HIV in an era of biomedicine? Well, before it was HIV AIDS, before it had a name at all, uh, many people would have seen this page in the July 3rd issue of the New York Times. This is July 3rd, 1981, uh, issue of the New York Times. They might have noticed this article here, small, uh, tucked away in the corner of the A20 uh, page, um, which discusses a rare cancer seen in homosexuals. Uh, and this article, in essence, picks up on a series of reports uh, made to the CDC over the previous several years, which we now know, again, entirely in retrospect, to be cases of late-stage HIV AIDS. We see reports, for instance, as this article discusses, of a rare form of cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma, or KS, which was killing young gay men in Los Angeles and New York. And this was strange because uh, KS rarely appeared in the US, and when it did, uh, when it did make its rare appearance, it was in people uh, usually over 50, um, 50 years old. Um, we also see reports of infections of pneumocystis pneumonia, or PCP, uh, also in young gay men. Again, strange because PCP uh, is endemic in, human, uh, in the human body, but only harmful in cases of severe immunosuppression. And finally, we also see reports, again, around the same period, uh, this is about in 10% of cases of uh, KS and PCP in the same individuals. So the question, at least in the very early days, was what is this new disease? First of all, uh, many people asked, was it even real or was it just another alarmist, uh, half-baked media smear against homosexuals. So this was a time, we have to remember, of uh, extreme, perhaps even almost unimaginable homophobia in the United States. Uh, some polls held that up to 75% of Americans viewed same-sex relationships or same-sex intimacy as wrong under any circumstance. And thus, uh, some gay men at the time remembered being dismayed by the New York Times report and by articles uh, like this one, subsequent follow-up article, follow articles like this one, uh, seeing them as just another in a long series of dubious uh, mainstream fear-mongering against gay people. And indeed, early press coverage of the disease tended to cast, uh, tended to cast it as a gay disease, as this um, headline from the uh, Observer, from the English newspaper, the London Observer, um, uh, reads. So we tended to cast it as a gay disease. Um, other articles might cast it as gay cancer. Uh, some even cast it as a gay plague. Even the early research designation of the disease uh, used by uh, researchers and healthcare providers as GRID, or gay-related immunodeficiency, and this is, a, um, this is from a uh, nursing magazine. Um, even these early research designations uh, only helped to solidify the perception that the disease was related uh, to someone's being gay. In September of 1982, uh, the CDC first used the term AIDS to describe the disease, and this was the name that um, persisted uh, to the present day. And this was a name which, uh, although many commentators uh, noted, was not satisfying in the broad stroke, and the broad strokes because, of course, uh, AIDS, AIDS implied health and, and comedy rather than uh, the horror which many people were experiencing, um, it was at least uh, more accurate in the particulars. So as we know, the um, uh, AIDS, the acronym signifies, uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So uh, this was a way of putting a lot of information into a very short amount of space. So acquired uh, signifies that the disease was not inherited, it was not congenital, one would acquired over the course of one's life. Um, immune deficiency signals an effect. Right? This is what is happening with the disease. And syndrome signifies that the disease is not a uh, pathological element itself, but a manifestation of some sort of underlying, underlying causal element, an as yet unknown causal element. And so what is the causal element? Again, at least initially, researchers and the public alike uh, tended to focus on the fact that many of the initial patients were gay and theorized that some sort of gay lifestyle was responsible for patients' conditions. Um, so if we think about responses to plague in the 14th century, uh, we might not be surprised that some, uh, some commentators, and uh, in fact, some people with AIDS themselves, uh, held that AIDS was a divine punishment for immoral behavior. Right? So, uh, God's ventions against uh, people for practicing a homosexual lifestyle. Others, uh, taking a somewhat more, uh, somewhat different tack, fuse a sort of secular moralism uh, with immunology, imagining AIDS as a consequence of the promiscuity and drug use that um, was assumed by many uh, to characterize homosexuality or be a feature of homosexual uh, lives. 
Uh, this was the so-called overload hypothesis, as it was sometimes called, um, and it was pursued um, by, among, among other people, uh, it was pursued by Michael Callan, uh, whose text we read for today. Here's Michael Callan coming into view here. Um, the idea of this hypothesis is that the behaviors of people with AIDS had been so excessive that their immune system simply collapsed under the burden of multiple abuses. Um, and as Callan wrote, and this is in an earlier essay than the one that we read, uh, he wrote, and I'll quote him to get the, so you can get the exact tenor of his words. He said, quote, we must accept that we have overloaded our immune system with common viruses and other sexually transmitted infections. He went on to say, we have remained silent because we have been unwilling to accept responsibility for the role that our own excessiveness has played in the current health crisis. But deep down, we know who we are and we know why we're sick. Um, and I read this to you because, of course, this is exactly the sort of signification that Treichler writes about. Right? He says, we know, we know why we're sick. Right? We have a statement of cause, a statement of identity, a statement of responsibility. And this is a way of making meaning uh, from an unknown disease. By 1982, however, the we who were sick had expanded considerably. Uh, it was not just gay men showing symptom of, symptoms of AIDS. Uh, the disease had also been reported in uh, male and female individuals who used heroin intravenously. Um, it had been reported in heterosexual female partners of intravenous heroin users, a uh, number of people from Haiti, a uh, number of blood transfusion recipients, and most tellingly, um, a number of infants and small children, uh, some blood transfusion recipients themselves, others whose parents worked in the sex industry or used heroin intravenously. This wide range of people, uh, including small children, um, strongly suggested that the, that the disease wasn't simply a matter of sexual or pharmacological overindulgence. Finally, in 1983, uh, researchers in France and the US, uh, well, in, independently in the, the story, is the story of this sort of uh, collaboration and rivalry uh, is too long to tell here, but um, in 1983, researchers in France and the US uh, confirmed the same pathological agent, a virus, uh, in the tissue of several people with AIDS. After some extensive debate, in 1986, the disease was officially named HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, and this is the combination of, and the combination of the ide uh, ideological agent and disease came to be called HIV AIDS. So maybe here is a good place to, to pause um, since now we have what roughly approximates a sort of contemporary idea of knowledge of the disease. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So I'll ask the first question. Great. And it comes from Karen Brobst, and it takes us back to one of the images that you showed uh, about the buffaloes. Yes. Could you kindly discuss the meaning of the pictures of buffaloes going over a cliff? Sure. So, um, well, my understanding is that the, this is a picture taken, I believe, it was from a diorama at the Smithsonian Institution, um, at, or, uh, at this, or rather, maybe the American Museum of Natural History. Um, Again, showing this, showing this idea of buffaloes uh, being driven by, I believe, by indigenous Americans over the edge of a cliff. Um, and so uh, this was uh, artist David Vonorovich's um, allegory for, uh, for HIV AIDS. So the idea that um, people were sort of uh, blindly, actually, this is not, this is not, in a sense, this is perhaps not unlike our, um, this is perhaps an, an inversion or a, a sort of a, a, a stylistic, um, it stylistically harmonizes with the photo, the uh, image of the uh, giant of barbarism sort of blindly lashing out. So in this case, it is, uh, it is an allegory for um, people who are sort of being driven blindly to their peril um, by fear and sort of uh, by fear and ignorance and unthinkingness. Uh, and so for uh, Vonorovich, this was a way of thinking about what was uh, happening with the HIV AIDS crisis, which at this point, of course, uh, which at the point, um, uh, at the point of his, his making the art was, was, um, uh, was if not invisible, certainly, um, that certainly, uh, certainly um, benighted, I suppose is the way of saying it. Cool. I, I really wanted to understand that picture too. I <laughs> thought it was very it's intriguing. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting piece. Um, we have another question um, from Marissa hernandez Kalman. Um, who asks, was sexual shaming or othering unique to the AIDS epidemic, or was it present in previous outbreaks? This is great. So we'll discuss this. This is something to keep in mind um, as we go forward. So um, 
it was no this is this is a sort of this is a this is a feature actually of um of uh, sexually transmitted infection um work uh for the uh you know for for the better part of the 20th century um what we see in fact is that uh public health officials um uh well, it's, it's a longer story but you know public health, health officials use a couple of different um methods to uh uh, to sort of to do what we now call contract contact tracing to trace diseases like uh, they're very interested in syphilis eradication, for instance, um, and frequently they see um, homosexual men as uh, reservoirs of uh, of illness, right? Uh, homosexual men and uh, minorities of various sorts. So of course we can imagine the uh, Tuskegee syphilis uh, study of um, in the 1930s and 1970s uh, as one example of, uh, if not quite sexual shaming, then um, than assumptions about people's sexual behavior. So in the case of the Tuskegee study, um, this, is a, this is a study conducted to study um, uh, basically the progress of untreated syphilis. And so uh, without um, uh, basically the uh, US Public Health Service uh, advertised that, um, that anyone uh, in and around Tuskegee could come and get, uh, that excuse me, black people, black men in and around Tuskegee could come and get treatment for their syphilis. Uh, and in fact, they weren't offering treatment. They were simply monitoring uh, the course of the disease allowing um, allowing these men to uh, both uh, themselves themselves suffer from the disease and potentially uh, pass it to other people. Uh, the rationale for this being that um, that the uh, that the black men are promiscuous and therefore we get syphilis anyway, right? And so this kind of assumption undergirds uh, again. If this is not quite sexual shaming, but it's a it's an assumption about people's sexual behaviors. Uh, same thing. Uh, same thing happens with um, um, uh, same thing happens with. Uh, gay men in this period. That having been said, um, again, another feature of uh, epidemiological research um, in this period is that investigators um, go through extensive training to to seem not judgmental, right, so that they can elicit um, elicit responses from the people that they are um, attempting to uh, survey. Um, yeah, and there's all sorts of, I mean, there's, uh, this guy, I don't want this answer to go on for too long, but there's all sorts of, uh, we could talk a lot about sort of venereal disease, uh, as it was called in the uh, mid-century venereal disease eradication campaigns in which um, typically which focus on the sort of the unclean uh, unclean women as sort of vectors of disease right so uh, the idea that it's very rarely it's very rarely that the, the male participant who is being sexually shamed in these um, the male the white male heterosexual uh, participant who is being uh, sexually identified as a sort of causal agent for spreading venereal disease um, again I realize that doesn't that perhaps doesn't precisely answer the, the exact focus of the question, but I think that maybe gets a sort of a more expansive, more expansive universe uh, into which HIV is emerging. So, um, and actually that's, I think that makes a good, uh, that makes a good um, stepping off point then for, uh, for examining our next section, which is, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit about the uh, sort of politics that emerge again, uh, not only around AIDS, but around the, the combination of uh, HIV and AIDS, right? So um, one thing I guess we want to look at now, um, we could say perhaps uh, the question that we're going to ask is, uh, what did identifying the disease uh, as caused by a virus, uh, say, like rather than a wrathful god or overindulgence or something like this, uh, do in terms of signification, right? So we want to look at, um, so again, meaning making is, is um, often, if not always, a political matter. And so uh, we now have not only a uh, a syndrome, but a um, pathological agent. And so uh, where does this get us in terms of making meaning of, um, of sickness? Well, so at least initially, um, one might suspect, again, this is thinking about, we can sort of make reflections on coronavirus as well. Um, one might initially suspect that moralism reproach and the stigma of AIDS as a gay disease, uh, as a specifically gay disease would dissolve uh, once a sort of uh, a causal pathological agent was identified. Um, and so that, for instance, is one of the underlying premises of this poster uh, produced in 1991. Um, so if we were to read the fine print on this caption, this poster shows a, uh, a quote unquote normal T cell on the right, sort of over here. And on the left, it shows a, uh, a T cell infected by HIV and T cells are sort of, uh, uh, cells that, uh, that uh, sustain the body's uh, immune response. Um, and then of course it has this caption to visualize this, right? Or visualize this, I suppose is the emphasis. And the idea here is that we, the viewer, are supposed to visualize this, or visualize this, excuse me, um, like right, injured cells, rather than, for instance, uh, stereotypical gay men or Haitian immigrants or drug users or sex workers, right, or any particular type of person who we might 
um, think of having HIV AIDS. So when we think of HIV AIDS, we should visualize this. Okay? So there's a strong endorsement then of the idea that science is, is blind to politics, right? Blind to group identity, blind to prejudice. Um, but of course, as we discussed for these past weeks, uh, diseases don't exist without politics, without ideology, without iconography, without meaning. So even a virus, uh, in a sense, has politics. And in the case of the identification of the age virus as an etiological agent of HIV, uh, excuse me, uh, the HIV virus as an etiological agent of AIDS, it is helpful, uh, at first at least, uh, to think in terms of, um, of three main reactions. Uh, and so uh, first, the identification of HIV uh, as the causal agent of AIDS energized an already extant movement towards personal responsibility for risky uh, behaviors, in particular risky sexual behaviors. And I'd say already extant uh, movement because, of course, uh, as we saw in our readings today, so we, we read uh, uh, all, well, you maybe have read all or, or portions of this pamphlet, How to Have Sex in an Epidemic. Um, uh, and as we know, this was written prior to there having been uh, a, uh, prior to the HIV uh, virus as, as, as having been identified as a causal agent of AIDS. And so it's not necessary to have identified a pathogen in order to urge people to modulate their behavior in the face of a new disease. Um, and as we saw in today's reading, uh, how to have sex during an epidemic counseled people in fairly straightforward sort of clinical terms, or at least those are fairly straightforward flat term, tones, uh, to practice what would have come to be known, what would come to be known as safe sex, uh, and it urged sex positivity, uh, all without a viral etiology for AIDS. Um, there were other pamphlets too, uh, other resources did likewise, uh, although sometimes with a different manner or tone. Uh, so these, this is the photograph of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. This is a San Francisco-based group, um, they're an activist group, a gay rights group, uh, who put out also, uh, believe without knowing about, um, about, uh, about um, how to sex in an epidemic, uh, they put out a small pamphlet entitled Play Fair. This is also on the subject of how to have uh, sex in a time of HIV AIDS. Um, and although racier and more irreverent in terms of the manner by which it addressed its audiences, uh, it came to a similar conclusion about sexuality and sexual behavior uh, as did Callan's text. And so the idea of play fair was that one should uh, be open with one's partners, one should modulate behavior, one's behavior according to the kinds of risks that uh, one and one's partners were, um, uh, were willing to accept. Uh, and in particular, the play fair advised that regardless of the number of partners one has, um, one should uh, wear, cost, wear, wear condoms, uh, at least for penetrative sex. Uh, these types of measures, again, are the origins of the, of the notion of safe sex uh, and of sex positivity that we use uh, sort of um, fairly frequently or uh, uh, without needing to unpack uh, in, uh, in, in frequent, uh, frequent everyday, everyday life. Um, and, so, um, and so this all comes again from this, uh, from a sort of pre-viral or, or just, uh, just around the same time as a viral ideology. Uh, for AIDS. Um, and of course, as I said, these measures could be discussed without need of a particular viral entity, um, although again, they were taken to prevent exposure for uh, exposure to STIs. Um, the identification of an HIV virus, however, helped to focus these campaigns and to offer specific advice, uh, for instance, on the risks of particular sex acts. So this is a um, public health poster uh, after the identification of HIV as a uh, causal agent of AIDS. Um, and I guess I would call you, I, I would invite you to uh, sort of admire the, the sort of uh, faux, uh, faux wordplay here. This is the ABCs of oral sex and HIV, right? So two kinds of acronym or two kinds of sort of abbreviated functions. And then of course the A is A, it, B is C, low risk, right? So uh, we expect some sort of uh, abacadarius and all we get is it is low risk. Um, and here there's another handmade poster again, uh, again, uh, uh, passing information about uh, about the relative safety of oral sex. This gives you kind of an idea of uh, what gay communities were thinking about uh, very early in the pandemic. Um, I should say it's important, first of all, to note here that uh, these early public health measures, uh, these early public health awareness measures, uh, were almost always uh, by private actors. That is, they were not promulgated by uh, official uh, state channels, uh, but rather by independent community groups. Also important to understand that um, given the medical establishment's continued pathologization uh, of homosexuality, the idea that one was to um, suddenly understand one's desire in terms of medical risk, uh, rather than, for instance, in terms of fulfillment or personal freedom, uh, was to many difficult to, difficult to stomach, right? Again, it seemed like another form of uh, repression uh, visited by, um, 
uh, by the established medical community uh, on an already uh, persecuted uh, community of, uh, of homosexual men in particular. Uh, the identification of a virus uh, rather than uh, a set of behaviors did help to ease some of this suspicion and misgiving. The idea of the HIV pathogen also expanded the sphere of possible interventions, uh, suggesting, for instance, not simply programs for discussing safe sex and sex positivity, uh, but also for protecting other uh, so-called at-risk groups. And so people like uh, uh, people who used intravenous drugs, for instance, uh, and, these, and these people could uh, be protected through programs uh, like needle exchange. Uh, again, these are difficult to pass politically, but can be done privately in the early 20th century, or excuse me, in the early uh, 1980s. More broadly, uh, and uh, this poster comes uh, well after 1987, uh, the idea that uh, AIDS was caused by a virus enabled the beginnings of a measure of thinking about AIDS as a general risk to all people uh, rather than just to gay men. Uh, so again, this is a this poster after 1987, uh, after, um, after we start to see more federal involvement. Um, but this idea, uh, this idea broadly caught on after the, um, uh, after the idea that AIDS was caused uh, by a virus. But here, in a sense, uh, is an irony, because rather than destigmatizing AIDS, uh, the idea that AIDS was caused by a virus, that it might be transmissible to anyone, enabled in many ways an expansion of stigma, and indeed prompted the threat of surveillance and police action. Uh, so here we have, for instance, a CDC report from 1984, for instance, which endeavored to prove through, again, this method of contract, contact tracing, that AIDS was sexually transmitted. This, is, uh, this report began before the uh, virus was discovered and then was published thereafter. Um, uh, and indeed, they did provide, uh, they did provide uh, strong support for the idea that, uh, that AIDS was a, uh, a sexually transmitted pathogen. Um, but this report also became the basis for an erroneous narrative that a single uh, so-called patient zero had introduced HIV to the US. And here, uh, what we're looking at here is this, uh, this map or this diagram from the report uh, is simply meant to be a visual representation of uh, sexual exposures among a group of gay men in different cities, all of whom presented with AIDS. Uh, so the important thing to remember here is that it does not represent, for instance, a chronological expansion, right? So these, these points out here, these, these points are all people, um, all sort of uh, abstract representations of people from different states, uh, the New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Florida, and so forth. These points out here are not people who caught the, uh, who, who came down uh, presented with AIDS um, later than people in here, right? This is just a sort of shows connections of people. Um, some observers, however, uh, journalists in particular, but researchers as well, um, took the notional middle point of the diagram, uh, so right here, um, to signify the beginning of the epidemic. Uh, the circle, therefore, was taken to represent the so-called patient zero at the initial center of this cluster. This so is the idea that this, that this person here, again, represented by the circle, was the first person to bring the virus into the US. Um, and in fact, this is uh, both a mistaken reading of the chart and a mistaken uh, nomenclature. Uh, the zero in this case actually was meant to, uh, was, is actually an O. It was originally meant to stand for O for out of California. Um, and uh, there's a very good book about this by Richard A. McKay, who's a historian at Cambridge. Um, there's a book called Patient Zero. So if you're interested in more of this, I'd recommend it. Um, so uh, this, me this misreading of the diagram, uh, in turn, facilitated a popular media narrative, one that persists to this day, that a single highly promiscuous homosexual man was responsible for starting the entire HIV epidemic in America. And so was, here we have um, the cover of the New York Post from October 6, 1987, uh, bearing the headline, The Man Who Gave Us AIDS. Right? And so uh, this patient O, who soon came to be called patient zero, uh, was identified by name and, uh, and vilified. Um, and again, this, uh, this narrative itself uh, is a way of further positioning both uh, homosexual people and same-sex desire as you know, pathological, deviant, even dangerous to the nation. Uh, the idea that AIDS was caused by a virus also raised fears of casual contamination, uh, not just through sex or intravenous drug use, but through everyday activities, um, fears, with, fears which this poster from Canada sought to dispel. Uh, so, um, and I want to call your attention again to the, so we can notice that, uh, again, this, this instructs people that uh, AIDS cannot be transmitted or HIV cannot be transmitted uh, from coughs, sneezes, or talking to someone. Um, but we might also notice that there's a particular emphasis in these, uh, in these vignettes that the poster uh, presents uh, on friendship, on things like play. Right? So again, this tells us that you can't, that sharing toys uh, won't uh, transmit HIV AIDS and hugging someone won't transmit HIV AIDS. 
Uh, let's see, over here, uh, we see that you know, sharing, sharing things like cups, plates, knives, and forks, right? Uh, uh, communal activities. Other germs can be spread this way, but not HIV AIDS. Sharing a toilet or bathroom, right? So these sort of uh, basic acts of community. Um, and I just wanted to point this out because it brings us back to sort of a recurrent feature that we've seen in pandemics, which is this idea of uh, sort of a social isolation following panic, uh, uh, panic surrounding a novel disease or novel pandemic, right? So we've seen, uh, we saw in, in plague and cholera, um, and to a lesser degree in pandemic influenza, sort of the uh, social isolation and shunning, right? Um, and here through this poster, we see an attempt to ameliorate it somewhat. Um, okay, so furthermore, the identification of a virus as the cause of AIDS raised the idea of police measures to stop its spread. And I use the term police measures here very specifically because uh, in the US anyway, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, the problem of AIDS was either uh, sort of ignored or elided at the sort of at the federal level, uh, or else treated as one as treated as one federal official put it as quote a law enforcement, not a medical problem. Excuse me, a law enforcement problem, not a medical problem. All right, and so this is again at the at sort of uh, top levels of the U.S. federal government. Uh, HIV/AIDS is seen early on again as a problem for law enforcement, a criminal problem, not a medical one. Uh, so again, not simply a matter of clinical intervention but a matter of legal measures. And so this uh, headline from the LA Times uh, in 1985 uh, gives the results of a, of a poll um, that the LA Times uh, promulgated um, in which a slim majority of Americans uh, favored quarantining, for instance, all of those people who tested positive uh, for having HIV AIDS. Um, uh, the same poll showed wide support for shutting down uh, institutions like bathhouses. Um, this was a measure that was pursued uh, actively in New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, and so bathhouses were meeting places for gay men. So uh, this is, I should say, this is a, um, this is a um, flyer for a bathhouse in San Francisco. Um, and people would go to these bathhouses for socializing, uh, for sex, for relaxation. Uh, they were, uh, in the uh, reminiscences of uh, many people, the center of gay communities, uh, many gay communities, and gay communities are multiple. Um, and they were also centers of money and power in these communities. Um, and it should be said that, again, uh, uh, these communities are not monolithic, so uh, some gay men uh, wrote in retrospect of approving, uh, somewhat uh, hesitantly, of the idea of closing bathhouses on uh, public safety grounds. Um, however, uh, this move also struck many as potentially a serious violation of civil liberties and a misapplication of government's, uh, government force. And of course, it's easy to see in this instance the prejudice that attends to such a move. Right? Um, people could of course have sex anywhere um, and have whatever sort of sex they wanted anywhere, uh, right? So uh, why fetishize the bathhouses, this uh, institution of gay community life, uh, especially in lieu of efforts to uh, destigmatize uh, HIV AIDS as a gay disease. Moreover, the fact of an identif identifiable virus, as we sort of alluded to uh, just now, uh, the fact of an identifiable virus opened up the possibility of testing living people uh, for the virus, or rather for antibodies to the virus. And this raised the specter of surveillance, of rosters of people uh, who were found to have AIDS, and of state-run programs of monitoring and exclusion. Uh, early on in the crisis, states like Arizona and Colorado had started collecting the names of people with AIDS. Uh, William F. Buckley Jr., a conservative columnist, uh, wrote in the New York Times that, quote, everyone detected with AIDS should be tattooed in the upper forearm to protect common needle users and on the buttocks to protect the victimization of other homosexuals. And I call your attention to the other there, a tacit assumption both on the part of Buckley and the editors of the New York Times uh, that people with AIDS uh, must be gay and must be uh, passing the disease uh, to other gay people. Um, moreover, finally, in May of 1987, uh, the US Public Health Service mandated HIV testing for immigrants and ban those who tested positive from obtaining visas. So all this to say that the injunction to quote unquote, visualize this uh, was on the one hand, a sort of a recommendation for individual act action. Right? So when I, the viewer of this poster, think of HIV AIDS, I ought to visualize this here. On the other hand though, much more went into visualizing a virus in action uh, than simply a personal reaction to electron micrographs. Uh, so making HIV AIDS visible, as we'll see momentarily, was indeed a, a political project, a very political one. Uh, so maybe here is a, again, a point at which we can stop just for a couple of questions. Hello, do you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. 
Wonderful. Um, I want to ask you a question that came in from Anna Coria about uh, funding. Given yeah. the politics of the virus, mm -hmm. um, who was funding research and how, uh, given the dynamics of the virus and how was it, how was that research hampered by um, it's the viruses, the associations that the medical and scientific right. community made about it? Well, so or William Buckley, I mean, so vividly illustrated right. by that quote from Buckley. Yeah, so um, much of the initial fundraising uh, for research was private, right? Uh, so so the, I guess, how to approach this answer, I can approach it from the, let me approach it first by saying much of the original uh, uh, fundraising for the virus was uh, for, for research into AIDS and then HIV AIDS um, was private. Um, the playwright Larry Kramer uh, rather famously held what I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was the first um, uh, um, fundraiser for AIDS research uh, just weeks after the um, weeks after the New York Times article that we said in his apartment in um, in New York. Uh, and so I think he raised something like six thousand uh, dollars for a doctor in New York who was trying to conduct research. Um, and thereafter, groups like the Gay Men's Health Crisis and um, other groups would hold um, you know would, would hold fundraisers parties things like this um, that would go towards AIDS research. Um, could, could I just yes. interject one thing? And that is another question that came in, actually. Susan C. wrote, Larry Kramer was an AIDS activist who died recently, who had significant effect on changing the government's response yes, to the AIDS right. crisis. Could you talk about the role of lay activists in affecting medical and political responses to pandemics? So you I and Susan were both thinking about Larry Kramer and his importance to this. Yeah, and in fact, we'll, we'll get into, um, let me, I'll put, I'll put a pin in that because we'll get into the, uh, exactly that sort of question uh, in the next section of the talk. Um, but uh, suffice to say that, again, in the recollections of, um, so again, there's, there's sort of this private fundraising apparatus. Um, and then I should clarify that when I say federal response, I mean, uh, we do have the, we do have diligent workers at the CDC and the NIH um, who are, who are uh, invested in, in working on this um, problem. Um, researchers at the time remember uh, uh, doing their research on a shoestring budget, you know, they had no funding at all. Um, it was very, it was very difficult to, uh, to find funding, including, um, including the, uh, the a young Anthony Fauci, who we, might, who we might remember from coronavirus today. So one of, one of the things about, uh, one of the things There was about, also a question about him, so. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I may or may not know, so let's, let's, let's hear it. I think it was when, when did he become, an, I'd have to find, there are many questions, but when did he become involved in, in AIDS research? It would have been, it would have been like sort of mid 80s, mid 1980s. I couldn't give you an exact date, but certainly he was involved by like 19, I want to say by 1987, he was, I'm recalling seeing his like name on sort of like presidential briefings by 1987, which is when we start to see more federal involvement. Um, possibly before that, but I'm, again, I'm, I don't recall seeing documents before that bearing his name or anything. So, um, but yeah, but, but early on, I mean, relatively speaking. Um, so yeah, I think that answers the questions, right? I do. Um, yeah, this Zoe? is- Zoe? Oh, go on. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Zoe, then we can ask away. I was just going to say, you also see, one also sees, um, well, I was going to say that just, you know, one finds, uh, particularly, particularly now, one finds all this, the uh, HIV AIDS crisis of the 1980s is sort of a who's who of political players now. So one finds a, um, memo from John Roberts, for instance, the current Supreme Court Justice, advising, I believe I'm getting this right, advising Reagan uh, not, to, not to tell the public that AIDS is not, uh, AIDS is not transmissible by, ca by casual contact until everyone's absolutely sure. So in, I believe in 1985, Reagan's going to sort of give a speech expressing sympathy for um, uh, families, uh, people in families uh, who, are, who have uh, HIV AIDS, and Roberts tells him, do not do that until we have better evidence, even though there's pretty good evidence by 1985. So anyway, we see all these names coming up over and over again. Um, well, I just had one, one question that I think would, would fit with this sort of line of questioning here um, from Scott McCausland. He says, please comment on the speed with which medical and government attention was directed to AIDS. I remember being struck at the fact that the response to Legionnaire's disease was comparatively swift and strong despite the fact that it was much less lethal than AIDS. Yes, exactly. So, well, well actually, that, that'll lead us into this next section. Suffice to say that um, federal response was, 
well, I was going to say in retrospect, but even at the time was, was thought to be woefully, um, woefully inadequate and woefully slow um, and, and thin besides. Um, but I will say to, pre to preface this, there was also, what we also see is, um, again, the, I just want us to bear in mind that the fact that there should be a federal response to, um, uh, to pandemic illness is in fact an artifact of the late 20th century, right? So um, you would not, one would not find, uh, one would not find demands for a federal response to plague, for instance, in the 1300s, right? So, um, right, just because the, the idea of the state and the idea of medicine was so different. Um, so what we're seeing is really, uh, is in part a, an assumption um, about what medicine ought to do and what, what governments ought to do to bring this sort of, um, again, much of this research government funded to, uh, to citizens living in these sort of, uh, these sort of resource rich places that, um, that have access to and that sort of rely on biomedicine as a part of their everyday lives. Um, and so maybe this is a good place to, uh, to get into that, uh, that very question um, and talk about, uh, talk about the sort of idea of political power. Um, and so as, I was, as, so as several people pointed out, um, in all of our foregoing discussion, uh, one conspicuously missing element, uh, we might say, is the absence of a vigorous public health response on the part of federal officials in the US, and so elected officials in particular. Uh, again, uh, the, the CDC and the NIH, uh, um, and the American, uh, the National Cancer, Inst National Cancer Institute, places like this, um, did, a, did, did a lot with very little. Um, uh, whereas the uh, response from elected officials was, uh, uh, was sort of deafening silence, right? And so, um, right, so this was this is sort of the missing element that many of us asked about. So let's look at that. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, in the absence of a strong federal leadership, uh, again, much of the response to HIV AIDS was, as I said, private, right? Uh, managed, for instance, through community organization like the Gay Men's Health Crisis. This was founded in 1982, so fairly early on in the pan pandemic. Um, other groups, you may look at other groups like uh, uh, Bibashi. This is a Philadelphia group uh, dedicated to uh, LGBTQ uh, health outreach. It wasn't called LGBTQ at the time. Um, and again, they're sort of uh, so, so small local groups, uh, mostly at the time. Um, and at least initially, uh, these groups tended to support or tended to be support organizations. So again, as I said, they would do private fundraising and, uh, and support research that way. Um, they would also sort of administer palliative care, uh, they would uh, sometimes run hotlines uh, for like information hotlines to distribute information about HIV AIDS, um, help with legal issues related to housing discrimination and work discrimination and so forth. Um, by 1987, however, uh, groups began focusing uh, not simply on sort of caring for their own community members, but on strong coordinated efforts to pressure the federal government and large companies to uh, take bold concerted action against HIV AIDS. Um, and so, uh, as I was suggesting earlier, uh, from the time of its discovery as a public health crisis uh, in July of 1981 uh, until May of 1987, uh, public, as I say, federal response uh, in the United States uh, and in Canada and, and other places as well, uh, to HIV AIDS amelioration was uh, conspicuously muted. Uh, as we saw, it was considered a police rather than a medical problem, right? A matter for law rather than uh, clinical intervention, legal rather than a clinical intervention. Um, and of course, as we noted in the uh, Q&A just now, the conservative U.S. President Ronald Reagan, uh, shown here in a uh, quite critical poster, we'll get back to this shortly, um, had specifically ordered uh, the Surgeon General of the U.S. Uh, not to prioritize or discuss HIV AIDS. Right? So again, this was a, a policy of silence on the part of the federal government. Um, there was, of course, there was research into, um, uh, there was research coordinated uh, through, the, um, through the NIH and the National Cancer Institutes. Um, uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, create public health interventions uh, on a shoestring budget. Uh, and these efforts had, by 1987, uh, produced a single therapeutic agent that seemed to halt the, product, the, the progress of AIDS. Uh, this was AZT, a compound produced by Burroughs Wellcome as a cancer therapy, uh, but which was found to be effective against HIV. Um, and I should say this is, again, this is, a, this is an institutional development of the late 20th century. So what, right, what we have is the uh, CDC, or the, me, the National Cancer Institutes in this case, I believe it was the National Cancer Institutes that was coordinating this, um, sort of issued a, a call for anyone uh, who had, uh, for, for any sort of uh, pharmaceutical company or chemical company who had um, a potential anti-retroviral anti agent um, 
to, to send it in for sort of clinical testing, clinical evaluation, right? And so in order to have this, you need sort of a coordinating agency in the middle and you need sort of a very robust uh, industry for making pharmaceuticals. Uh, and, you know, and this is sort of a cut and try method just to, uh, it's a call to send in whatever stuff you have and, uh, uh, and the NCI would test it. And so, um, and so again, uh, this, the, what seemed to be affected was AZT, this compound uh, that had, as I said before, been produced by Burroughs Welcome, a British company as a cancer therapy. Uh, but which was found to be effective against HIV. And so on the one hand, um, this seemed to be sort of a, a wonder drug, right? And, a, um, and proof that again, the system was working, right? Uh, people with severe AIDS benefited. Uh, if it was not a cure, uh, then it was certainly great progress. And this we might think is very much in line with uh, McFarlane Burnett's vision of medical progress, right? Uh, with the entire complex of medicine, right? We have drug companies, technological innovation, government research organs. Uh, and when you bring all these things together, um, it yields cures, things like AZT. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, um, patients noted uh, severe short-term side effects, so nausea, dizziness, confusion, headaches, insomnia, numbness. Uh, for many people, this was uh, no cure at all. Uh, other people wondered, um, well, it works for very severe, uh, for severe AIDS. What about people who tested positive for HIV um, but didn't have AIDS? And one of the other side effects of testing, which I, uh, I should have mentioned, is also that it became apparent that uh, rather than a sort of a two-year period from uh, uh, from infection to 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 death, um, it was discovered that people could live for a very long time uh, with HIV um, without manifesting uh, with manifesting AIDS. Um, and so this uh, this pin, uh, as you can see, is critical. The, the idea is not that this person has uh, survived HIV AIDS, but the person who wore this is saying that they have survived uh, the drug itself that is meant to uh, meant to ameliorate the effects of the virus. Um, some groups also criticize the profits being generated by the drugs manufacturer, uh, in contrast with the paucity of treatment option for people with AIDS, um, right? And so there's this, this question is, you know, why should there be only one drug for HIV AIDS when there are uh, scores, of, uh, scores of other drugs for uh, managing uh, comparatively uh, uh, less lethal uh, conditions of, again, of less marginalized people? Uh, and again, this is, uh, this is small print and it's just pushing the, uh, the boundary of my resolution, so I'll read the small print to you. Um, the caption here says, the US government has spent $1 billion over the past 10 years to research new AIDS drugs. The result, one drug, AZT. It makes half the people who try it sick, and for the other half, it stops working after a year. Is AZT the last best hope for people with AIDS, or is it a shortcut to the killing that Burroughs Welcome is making in the AIDS marketplace? Scores of drugs languish in government pipelines while fortunes are made on this monopoly. And so here we just have sort of embodied, again, in this, uh, in this sort of take on a Coca-Cola ad, um, we see the perception of slow progress and lagging federal response to a crisis in marginalized communities. And so uh, in this environment, so we see a shift from community action, the sorts of uh, small uh, local, intervention, uh, local intervention organizations, uh, to direct action campaigns to pressure state authorities and private companies to do more to address HIV AIDS. Uh, and someone asked about Larry Kramer, uh, so perhaps the uh, most well-known of these groups, the most certainly the most high profile of these groups, uh, was ACT UP. Uh, this was a group founded in 1987 by AIDS activist uh, Larry Kramer, who, as I said, was, was very early on, a um, very early on grasp of the, both the uh, severity of the crisis and the need for, uh, the need for vigorous public response. Um, and uh, so uh, one thing that Kramer's group apprehended was that uh, making AIDS visible in the age of mass communication involved more than just visualizing a virus. Right? It involved visualizing uh, and making, making visible the political underpinnings of biomedicine. And so um, and such groups like ACT UP employed a striking visual vocabulary for public outreach programs. Um, so you might be familiar with this, uh, this uh, iconic poster, these uh, silence equals death sort of uh, poster, which um, on the one hand sort of uh, it appropriates the uh, pink triangle used uh, uh, used by uh, Nazi Party to uh, to label homosexuals, um, and it has this very sort of uh, very al almost algebraic um, uh, algebra algebraic rhetorical structure, right? Silence and death are equivalent, um, right? And so um, by approaching uh, language the language of of advertising, right? This sort of um, uh, this sort of vigorous assertive language of advertising, the language of graphic design, of packaging of fine arts. Um, uh, and by using these sort of uh, rhetorical devices and visual devices as tools, 
Um, and I should say these are the same tools as uh, we saw used by drug companies, among others, to market their wares. Um, these groups created visually compelling arguments, uh, both in this case, uh, not for progress without revolution, but both for progress and revolution, right? So uh, both for the idea of medical progress and sort of structural reimagining of how uh, medicine, government, and uh, patient, uh, patient and patient advocacy ought to work. Um, so uh, the groups, these groups focus, for instance, on political leaders rather than people with AIDS. Uh, so here we see, for instance, again, uh, we saw this before, this is US President Ronald Reagan, uh, again, as the target of a rhetorical attack, right? And so, of course, it's just play on words, you know, he kills me, right? Um, uh, and so this seems, this seems obvious enough, but then again, we also think, um, we also contrast this again with the representation of patient zero that we saw before, right? And so uh, in this instance, uh, it is the, uh, the person with AIDS who is, in, who is at the center of the blame for the crisis, right? Who's the, 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 sort of the, the target of, uh, of blaming. Um, in contrast, uh, this idea here visually and conceptually reinforces the idea that it's people in power who need to accept responsibility, who need to take blame uh, for the epidemic. Uh, to put it another way, uh, these groups insisted that HIV AIDS was not a medical crisis or a public health crisis, but chiefly a political crisis. And again, they were, uh, they were very clear, uh, certainly by the middle of the 1980s, uh, that this was not just a crisis which affected gay, white, middle-class men. Uh, so here again, the um, fine print of this poster, which again casts, uh, uh, casts the HIV AIDS crisis as a political crisis, as AIDS gate, and uh, paints, uh, paints Reagan as a sort of bewildered if slightly satanic figure. Um, the text here reads that, quote, 54% uh, of people with AIDS in New York City are black or Hispanic. AIDS is the number one killer of women between the ages of 24 and 29 in New York City. And then asks, what is Reagan's real policy on AIDS? Genocide of, of non-whites, non-males, and non-heterosexuals? And then closes again with this rhetorical, um, this rhetorical couplet, silence equals death. Okay, so we see compelling visuals, compelling rhetoric, and compelling messaging. Um, and here this uh, advertisement uh, uh, repeats the theme calling in this case uh, media complacency to account. Uh, so the, um, the text here reads, uh, tells us that uh, one in every 61 babies uh, is born with AIDS or born HIV antibody positive. So why, why is the media telling us that heterosexuals aren't at risk? Uh, and then goes on to say, because these babies are black. These babies are Hispanic. Ignoring, and then goes on to say, ignoring AIDS, ignores the, ignoring color, ignores the facts of AIDS. Stop racism, fight AIDS. Right? Uh, again, a compelling counterpoint uh, to the idea that we saw earlier that we simply need to visualize the virus in order to visualize AIDS. Um, so, uh, I guess I should wrap up quickly. Uh, in addition to visual materials, these groups also stage protests calling for uh, quicker turnaround times for drug approvals and less plotting methodical drug studies. Uh, here is a 1987 protest in Wall Street, uh, in New York City, uh, calling attention to housing discrimination, uh, the indifference of capitalist America to the health of marginalized peoples, and the need for more and better HIV research. Um, here, just a hometown shout out. This is a demonstration in Chicago. Again, I believe this is early 1990s. And here in 1990, a protest outside the NIH, um, uh, a uh, uh, the, the, the protest was called Storm the NIH. This was an ACT UP event uh, to pressure the National Institutes of Health to develop more effective therapies and quicker pipeline for the approval of novel HIV AIDS therapies. And I should say, it also comes up that uh, we had a question about Anthony Fauci's role. Um, so apparently, uh, representatives from ACT UP, he was apparently very involved with uh, trying to loop ACT UP into the process uh, as per their requests, um, but didn't get much traction. Um, uh, with his political bosses. Uh, and so he was apparently informed in advance of this protest. And while uh, he was somewhat dismayed, um, he was apparently still supported. Um, so these protests, uh, in particular the 1990s, again, this 1990s storm, storm the uh, NIH protest. Uh, here, a photograph by uh, Donna Binder uh, shows one of the protesters uh, uh, on the lawn of the NIH. And here's the building in the background. Um, these protests eventually earned activists and groups a seat at the proverbial table in discussion with scientists and government officials, again, including Fauci. Um, and, uh, and another sort of feature of these protest movements was that um, activists had sort of uh, came uh, armed, with the, armed with the science. They learned the science. They were able to craft policy with officials. Uh, one scientist recalled with some astonishment, uh, meeting a quote, a girl with earrings, with earrings and tattoos who had read all of the literature, right? Another scientist recalled, 
uh, rather tellingly, uh, thinking that it, it's scary what they know. Right? So we wonder, why should it be scary that non-scientists are involved in the scientific process? Um, this led uh, to combination therapies in 1992, uh, longer life expectancy for HIV AIDS patients, uh, and it was possible by 2002 to live in, uh, indefinitely with HIV. Um, I should say, uh, as of the early 2000s, uh, we see AIDS rates leveling off where there's political support resources and visibility uh, for AIDS, uh, for HIV AIDS care and prevention, uh, and on the rise where the opposite persists. So let me just fade to black for some concluding thoughts. Um, and so uh, what I want us to think about, uh, not just with HIV, uh, AIDS or uh, with influenza or cholera or plagues or pandemics or diseases of the past in general, um, are the ways in which uh, politics, power, iconography, ideology, um, and so forth, uh, shape our responses to, uh, to diseases in the present, uh, and also how our present responses will help us uh, to shape the future. Uh, and so with that, maybe, maybe some discussion would be in order. Okay. I don't have my slide of, I don't have my slide of names here. <laughs> All right. Well, um, there are some some questions that sort of tie into those last Great. things you were mentioning, Michael. So uh, if you don't mind, I was going to ask a couple of those and then you can lead yeah. into the discussion of the text. Um, so the first batch had to do with um, this issue of, of uh, both law enforcement and government. So um, the first one is from Parsa. Uh, and says, can you elaborate more on the role of police and law enforcement in relation to HIV AIDS? What are some examples of the police, how, that, how the police were empowered to intercede? Oh, okay, so um, well, we discussed a couple. I mean, uh, we see like raids on things like bathhouses. I mean, so first of all, I should say there's a long history of um, uh, police persecution of, uh, of uh, gay communities, right? And so. Um, this was, in fact, sort of the, the impetus for the uprising of, uh, for the uh, Stonewall Uprising of 1968, which is sort of the, um, held as the genesis of the, um, of the gay rights uh, movement. Um, and so, um, uh, and so in, in that sense, uh, we see sort of a long history of, of uh, law enforcement raids. Um, we also see uh, instances, again, of um, people being denied entry to the U.S., uh, on the basis of sexuality, I mean, this is fairly late, I believe, in like, I want to say the late 80s or early 90s. So we see uh, threats that people who are, um, people who, uh, this is well after, so that, again, a short capsule history is that in 1973, um, homosexuality is, is taken out of the list of sort of uh, confirmed psychiatric disorders. Uh, and so it is no longer, it's no longer considered a psychiatric disorder. Uh, and yet uh, the, the sort of uh, U.S. Public Health Service is still, um, uh, in the, I want to say, again, I want to say right around the turn of the 80s or not, into the 90s, I can't, I can't remember the exact date, um, passes sort of a, passes a rule that people who are journeying into uh, the United States for an AIDS conference cannot, uh, cannot come. Um, so we see things like this. I mean, uh, there are, again, um, you know, by police actions, I mean, broadly, sort of things like surveillance actions, like, again, like lists compiled of um, people with, uh, people with AIDS, um, there are, uh, there are, and there are still uh, thoughts about like enforcing uh, laws against people who knowingly spread HIV/AIDS, and so that's one of the uh, that's one of the questions about um, this sort of so-called patient zero is like, should you be criminally liable uh, if you um, knowingly have sex with someone and don't tell them that you're HIV positive? And again, of course, you know, one uh, you know one notes that one can do this as a heterosexual person um, and endanger someone's life, but you know, it's, it's rarely discussed in these terms. So those are some, I mean, those are some examples. Um, I mean, we can see, and there's examples from other countries as well. So, you know, again, police raids in Canada, things like this. Great. And then um, the other question in that sort of area was uh, from Terry Albano. Uh, was Reagan and the federal government the only target of ACT UP and the other AIDS activists? Were religious institutions also targeted given the rise of the Christian coalition and their support for Ronald Reagan and conservative politics? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, I focused sort of mainly for the sake of time on uh, on federal response. But yeah, so uh, so ACTUP uh, sort of had a uh, oops, excuse me, sort of from the computer. Uh, ACTUP spread a wide net. So yeah, so um, uh, the religious figures, you know, particularly those who who um, 
uh, who demonize the homosexuality or, or, or safe sex practices, for instance, were targeted. Um, uh, corporations as well. So the March on Wall Street was, uh, was, not, a, was not a march, uh, especially against the federal government, but more on sort of uh, the institution of capitalism, right, which, was gener which was generating, you know, which uh, activists saw uh, um, rightly, I think, as, uh, as being more focused on um, making profits and saving lives. So yeah, it was a, it was a very broad spectrum. Um, broad spectrum, but not unfocused movement. In fact, in fact incredibly focused given its, uh, given its scale. Um, there, Emily, did you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, there are a number of questions about popular culture and the movie Philadelphia, for example, but also Ryan White, the AIDS quilt. Yep. Could you say something about the way that popular culture um, and media either changed or reinforced or created more sympathy for um, AIDS patients over time? Yeah, there's a couple, I mean, there's a couple of moments that come to mind. Um, so one sort of, one thing that immediately rises to mind is that um, it's often said that one sort of turning point in the visibility of HIV AIDS uh, was the death of actor Rock Hudson um, of HIV AIDS. And so, you know, it's often, it's noted that he was sort of a, um, a heartthrob and a kind of a paragon of masculinity. And so uh, when he died, I believe in 1985 of, uh, of AIDS, um, he, you know, uh, any, as, as I, one historian has said, you know, either, you know, any number of, uh, uh, you know, any number of these items would have been newsworthy, but in combination, they were very dramatic. So the fact that Rock Hudson was gay, for instance, was, uh, was a bombshell. Uh, the fact that he was dead and the fact that he had died of AIDS was, um, was a turning point in sort of people's realization of the, um, of, I guess, the, the sort of, uh, oddly of the magnitude, it's odd to say the magnitude of the crisis when it involves one people, uh, one person. Um, it was also, uh, uh, again, anecdotally, um, I, say, I say I've read this anecdotally and I can't remember uh, how well it was proven in various histories, but it's also anecdotally held as a moment when uh, Reagan himself, who was friendly with Rock Hudson, uh, began to acknowledge the severity of, uh, of the AIDS crisis. So that's, that's one sort of moment. Uh, again, the um, Ryan White is sort of another, uh, is another moment. So Ryan White is a, um, uh, a school age uh, school age boy who was uh, whose family who was denied um, denied access to he was wasn't allowed to go to school because he was uh, HIV positive um, and so his family entered sort of years of legal struggles to try to uh, to overcome this which I guess would also be another example of um, of police action right of police uh, restriction um, I'm trying to recall I don't actually recall offhand when when and how the red uh, AIDS ribbon was produced. Um, I want to say that's an early '90s innovation, but I can't remember offhand. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and as for the as for the sort of the reception theory aspects of things like Philadelphia or the AIDS quilt, um, I don't know much about that. Um, you know, certainly certainly within the art world, uh, there is still, uh, and again, this is not precisely popular culture, but within the art world, there's still reverberations of. Uh, Actually, multiple reverberations of the HIV/AIDS crisis. So there was, um, first of all, it's it's not infrequently said that that the HIV/AIDS crisis was sort of the, the generative point of the uh, of, con of contemporary art in America. Um, and as recently, and yet, as and then as recently as I want to say 2014, I believe, I think it was the Tacoma Museum of Art. Someone who has internet access will surely fact check me on this. But I believe it was the Tacoma Art Museum or maybe a gallery in Tacoma, Washington had a sort of retrospective of, of art and HIV, uh, HIV uh, AIDS in art um, that, came under, that came under heavy fire for its exclusion of, uh, of artists of color, right? And so uh, the idea was that in spite of uh, communities of color being um, disproportionately affected by HIV AIDS, the art world still saw it as largely a, um, a uh, white uh, male gay phenomenon. Uh, so again, so all this, all this to say that, um, well, this to say that reactions to the sort of the sort of popular culture reactions to the HIVAs are still roiling, right? They're, so they're still, they're still very live, um, even as the sort of immediacy of the crisis is um, seems to have receded. Just another another one along those lines is Nicole Trottier um, points out how significant was Magic Johnson's announcement to to the country's also outlook. On the disease, it's a good question. I mean, I, 
I remember hard being, to measure that, but um, it, again, it was a significant moment. Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I, I, I as a as a child was I was not a basketball fan, and I remember that, and I remember thinking, oh my goodness. So, I mean, certainly, um, you know, it's it certainly I think it seared itself in the imagination of many people. We have a comment from a lawyer about immigration policy. Shall I go ahead and read yeah, that? Yeah. So this is from Claire R. Thomas, friendly immigration lawyer and law professor here. Thank you, Claire. Until 1990, the United States was the only country in the world with an explicit policy of excluding visitors and immigrants because of their sexual orientation. Further, Obama rescinded the blanket HIV ban on intending immigrants and visitors in January 2010. I remember being at work that day at a community-based legal organization funded by Ryan White in Harlem and how the office all broke out in tears of joy, knowing that our clients and friends would no longer be separated from their family members due to their HIV positive status. Wow, that's very moving. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that also, in a sense, maybe we should, do you want to talk a bit about the document? Because yes, one so thing that's striking about this um, the question and the answers is something that I, I referred to early in the introduction was that we have lived through it. We are now dealing with a pandemic that has marked our lives in maybe very different ways, but that we all guard some sort of memory about AIDS that we learned, remember learned about it or knew of someone who had it or of a figure who had it. And this also in a sense, um, well, let's see how this relates to the document. Can you pull up yeah. the document? Yes, and uh, I'm going to do this cautiously because as we saw at the beginning, my computer's a little bit, it's acting a little funny. So I don't, but if I get, if I, if I end up dropped, I will, I'll be back. Okay, but I want to thank Claire again for her contribution. Yeah, that really is a moving story. Yeah, I'd be very interested in other people's recollections if, um, if you feel like submitting them. Okay, so let me gently, gently get this here. Um, in the meantime, do uh, what are you thinking about for um, just for sort of uh, where do you think we should start with this? Well, you know, first of all, I think it is worth making talk a little bit about the authors. Okay. Um, Hold on, wait, wait. I think I think I got this here. Well, so okay, uh, sorry. Okay, going to screen, share my screen. Whoops, whoops. Okay, going to screen share. Okay. How are you doing there? Oh, how am I doing? Yes. I'm doing well. Thank you. There it is. So I guess one of the big questions is. <laughs> Why did you pick this document? I, I think that some people might have been a bit surprised when they opened it up because yeah, you have I, your I, cover sheet on it. Yes, I should say, yeah, I mentioned in the cover sheet that uh, that this was did go into quite explicit detail, but um, I think we, many people did not see that cover sheet. So, um, so perhaps it was surprising. Well, you know, I um, one of the reasons, so this, 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 served, uh, this served double duty for me in terms of, sorry, this is like, Nothing but problems today. Okay, there. So this sort of double duty for me. So first of all, it's exciting because it's um, just in terms of, I guess, uh, the practice of history. It's ex exciting as an archival document. Right? This is not something that um, this is not widely published. Right. So this is not something that um, this is not something that at least until recently. I, I haven't checked recently, but that one could just sort of download offline very easily. Uh, download online very easily, and so this is sort of a it's a, it's a bit of micro history, right? As, as, as opposed to say like the uh, things that we read for uh, cholera or for pandemic influenza, right? So these mass publications. So this is a small document written for a, a small audience. Um, the second thing that I thought was really useful to think through was, um, again, that the, the authors were, um, uh, were AIDS activists, right? They were, they were, um, they also were co-authors of the these things called the Denver Principles, right? Which is uh, which is where we get the term uh, "person with AIDS" from, right? They they said so. They were very they were very um, adamant about the idea that people with AIDS should be treated with respect, should not have things like uh, should not have to worry about things like 
housing, like vocation, right? And should be treated with, with care and with love uh, rather than sort of shunned and stigmatized. Um, and yet, uh, as, as gay men writing, uh, writing for other gay men, uh, I just wanted to make the point, I guess, I, I thought it was interesting to sort of think through the sorts of layers of, of moralism and medicine that were, um, that were invested in this text, right? Uh, so this idea of, well, first of all, this idea of responsibility and, and someone's responsibility to sort of know facts, right? Um, and then there is the, um, you know, and then of course there is the idea that they are, at this point I believe uh, they are still, um, well, I would clearly at the time of publication, they're still not convinced that HIV is the causal agent of AIDS. And in fact, uh, Sonnabin, uh, this guy here, uh, for a long time thereafter, sort of long after it was medical establishment, was uh, very, very skeptical of the idea that, that it was just one causal agent, right? And I think one of the reasons is because uh, a single causal agent removes some of this moral impetus, right? This is actually some of the criticism, the same criticism that we see of germ theory in the, 19, in the 1860s, right? Uh, if you stop worrying about filth, right? If you start worrying about filth in people's behaviors, um, and you just start to focus on germs, then, um, then people can kind of act the way they want, right? They don't have to sort of keep themselves, right? Or they don't have to manage themselves, I guess is the modern way of putting it. So yeah, so that was sort of a very longish, longish answer to your question, but yes, that is, that is some of the reasons why I chose it. It's just a, it's sort of a fascinatingly written text, right? It's somewhere between a clinical medical text and something very vernacular. It has all these, uh, has all these, elements to it. How about, do we have any- I wonder if there's, are there people from the audience who want to make comments about the document and what struck them about it? It, it struck me too that it, it certainly is from a particular moment in terms of how it talks about the, the cause of the disease. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, very, yeah, very much so, right? So, like, there's, uh, it, you know, uh, we have, a, you know, on this page, right? So, uh, cytomegalovirus, for instance, I didn't get into this for time, but cytomegalovirus is, for instance, thought to be a, uh, a, a, a likely etiological agent of, of AIDS at one point, right? So, this is sort of a roster of the things that people were thinking. It's a, it is itself an archive of, of uh, thought just on the cusp of the identification of HIV as an etiological agent. I mean, also, again, just like some of these some of these turns of phrase, right? What began as sexual freedom has become a tyranny of sexual, sexually transmitted diseases, right? So, um, you know, it has this, it has this flair of a manifesto, right? And this uh, sort of, mm -hmm. uh, and this reminiscence of, and yeah, it really, it really puts the stakes very nicely, right? So um, for people who are sort of, who are sort of trying to come to grips uh, with this crisis, uh, you know, again, many men objected to the idea that they had, fought for so many years to sort of be able to express themselves sexually and to be able to sort of ex experiment quite sometimes quite quite wildly I suppose and then now they're being told they can't do that anymore. Well Victoria makes an important point she writes uh, this document along with the Denver principles mark a beginning in modern patient advocacy this yeah. kind of information sharing as well as assertion of patient rights was unheard of in the early eight, 1980s that was all, also the challenge when ACT UP began working with Fauci. The medical establishment was not used to patients who insisted on being partners with their doctors. So it refers back to your earlier point too about these were activists who knew the medical literature. They knew about the disease. Right. There is this, it's almost, you know, I think back to the, um, was it the influenza treatment that, no, the cholera treatment that we read. Mm -hmm there was this sort of accessibility to the medical care, right? That you could do it with your home. This is a different kind of accessibility that the patients were laying claim to. Yeah, and there's an interesting story also, um, an interesting story that also it's Stephen Epstein, uh, I can't remember the title of his, the book where he says this right now, but he also makes the point that actually the fact that many of the people who were uh, within the communities of, uh, of people with AIDS were also, um, Often, sort of highly educated professionals, sometimes with with scientific degrees, allowed uh, allowed many people to sort of circumvent the things like drug approval process, right? So, uh, if you could you could synthesize uh, antiretroviral drugs if you knew the right person, right? And you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to go uh, through the normal channels. So, right, yeah. So we see this sort of exactly this resurgence of um, well, I guess yeah, the birth of modern uh, the birth of modern patient advocacy and the resurgence of 
a sort of older notion of the way that medical medicine ought to be practiced, at least in terms of hierarchies of knowledge. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, there's also a note here that uh, Richard, Berko, B Richard Berkowitz um, was the co-author of both works cited here and that um, they were largely those of Dr. Joseph Sonnevend. Richard Berkowitz is also in the photograph that you showed. And it is my hunch that Richard Berkowitz himself it may be writing this, uh, hmm. this missive, uh, which brings us back, so you may want to comment on that, but it brings us back to this question of what does it mean as a historian to study something and teach about something that, we rem that people remember and that people in certain ways may know better than you do. Well, or have a very different, you know, sort of very personal vested experience in it uh, versus the Black Death that went through Europe in the 14th century. So I should say, I mean, this is, this is purely, um, purely anecdotal and purely personal, but I, I will say that it is, so first of all, I'm a 19th century historian, right? My, my expertise lies sort of somewhere between the 1830s and 1930s. Um, and so I'm, I'm very much not used to dealing with, uh, you know, most of my subjects have been dead for a long time and I'm used to dealing with them through, through reading text and reading mail. So um, I have to say, I, like, I, I, I'm completely thrilled by this process. So like every time, every time you say there, there's someone who actually experienced this, I find it, um, I literally experience that as a, as a rush. Like it really, it really, there's sort of an adrenaline uh, to it. So, uh, so yeah, so just purely experientially, um, it's, a, it's a terrific sensation, not one that I'm especially used to. Um, again, because most of the time when I, uh, you know, uh, most of the time when this topic comes up, it's in the context of say undergraduate lectures in which most of the people that I lecture to as undergraduates, this, this is outside the range of their living memory, right? So this is, um, it's absolutely a thrill. So thank you to all of you who are sending in comments. Um, it's really, uh, really fantastic. Here's another um, comment by Jeremiah. I was inspired by this document, especially since it was gay men writing to gay men about how to take care of themselves. In a way, it showed how these living in the community could communicate clearly with the community in the absence of clear, constructive public communication. Yeah, and one gets a sense also from, from yeah, one gets a sense, and I think the, the word that you just used, care, was really important because one gets a sense from this document. That Jeremiah used. The word. Yes, well, yes, that Jeremiah used that you, that you verbalized. Um, yes. That, uh, that uh, yeah, this idea of care is really apparent, and it comes out again. It also comes out in in manuals like Playfair. I believe it comes. I, mean, I believe the, one of the last words of the Denver Principles is in fact care. The, the last section is about care, right? So it is this, um, and it is in this respect also I think a unique document in terms of sort of um, history of contemporary medicine, right? Again, so this this idea of this idea of care as well as sort of um, rigorous biomedical knowledge. So yes. Now, Parsa has a slightly different read on it, so I'll read what this analysis is. I think this document is interesting because it also seems to go hand in hand with the rise of neoliberalism in the field of public health. The explicit reference to individual responsibility as a way forward seems to have been the language widely used during this time period. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is... Acceptable. I mean, I guess I'd have to think about, I guess I'd have to think a little bit more about whether it's completely characteristic of some of a neoliberal sort of uh, uh, viewpoint. But yeah, I mean, I think that is, it is also, um, it is also, it is, it is of a piece with a, with a particular variety of uh, medical dialogue in this period. Is, what I, is, is certainly what I'd say. So yeah, I think that that uh, that observation is opposite. Uh, it, it turns out Richard Berkowitz is not in the audience, but someone who na names him knows him named Richard is. So okay. we are we are Thank almost you. connected. We right. he's close. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you so much again for. Your, I know it's your a wonderful thing to it's really learn um, Do you want to say anything else about the document? Um, no, I mean, I think I've, I've covered most of it. I mean, again, this is... Someone also re remarked on it, it being quite explicit and, and noticing that. Yes, right. Well, it's very frank, right? Right. Um, and again, I, I mean, maybe if I had had my, um, 
I think if I'd had uh, a little bit more time and consideration, it would be interesting to contrast this again with, you know, with things like CDC recommendations on the one hand and things like Playfair on the other hand, which is both as explicit, but also kind of funnier and like, raunchier, right? So like there's, there's a spectrum of sort of ways that one can structure public health interventions um, of, this, of this nature. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoe, are there other questions cropping up that we think should be addressed? Um, there's a lot of really great observations and memories. Oh my gosh, it's after period. eight. <laughs> uh, I know we're running really late. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been trying to, to I was so uh, absorbed paste some of these, these in the, questions that I lost the, track of time. Yeah. Um, I've been trying to put some in the in the chat here. Um, you know, I hate to hate to I mean I'm just gonna put some of them in real quick so that other people can see them. So they're they're just really pretty cool. Um, but uh, I don't think we have time to answer them unfortunately. So um well i think we should now michael can you go back to the yes, can you we'll test your technological that. skills one more time please for us All right. i think i got this one Hold and on. bring us back to the final slide um bring it back i do once again want to thank the hundreds of people who have joined us this evening we of course want you to encourage you to come back in some shape or form and take a class with us. I hope to do more of these lecture series or single standalone lectures. I'm hoping for one in about two weeks, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I also remind you all to please enter the drawing so that you may be one of the 20 people who will be able to be at the Michael Rossi discussion next week. And I will serve as moderator there, but in that setting, you will be able to articulate your own opinions and thoughts. I won't, I'll just help a little bit in terms of managing the chat. So with that, I wanna thank again, Gus and Zoe, and of course, Michael Rossi. It's been a wonderful series. It's been a wonderful four weeks learning with you. Um, and to our audience, thank you again. Please stay well and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.